Many people ask why America surpassed Europe and became a global superpower. The main reason can be traced back to five men known as the Founding Fathers of America. They were instrumental in propelling the economy and industry of America to new heights, ultimately leading to its superpower status. When we look at the billionaires of today, we see that most of them have accumulated their wealth through technology, such as Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. However, if we want to identify the wealthiest business person in history, we need to go back more than a hundred years. We need to look at a wealthy individual who, despite passing away around a century ago, still remains unmatched by any contemporary capitalist. This is the story of the Standard Oil Company, which was not an ordinary company but rather had the largest monopoly in the world. Standard Oil did not always possess such immense power. It gradually acquired it over time. Let's go back to 1839 when a boy was born in New York and his name was John. John D. Rockefeller was the eldest son of William Rockefeller, who owned an apothecary in Richford, New York. John's father had multiple wives and children with each of them. However, after a while, he abandoned all of his wives, including John's mother, and took all the children to live with a woman named Nancy Brown, forming an unconventional family. Whenever John asked his father for money, his father would say he didn't have any. But John wanted to have his own money, so he would work for the neighbors and earn some cash. When John turned 15, his father decided to relocate the family to Cleveland, Ohio. Since John had a taste for money, he didn't like going to school and believed it would waste his time. That's why he dropped out of school at the age of 16 and started looking for work. His first job was as a clerk in a small office, earning a meager salary of 50 cents per day, which would be approximately 14 Don dollars in today's rate. He worked there for two years, and despite outperforming adults, he didn't get a raise because he was still considered a child. He worked there until the age of 18, and then he declared that he would no longer work for others. He used the money he had saved, took a loan, and opened his own office. Entrepreneurship was in his blood from a young age, as he knew how to make money even at a young age. He would buy products from farmers and sell them to stores. In 1857, at the age of 18, through these transactions, he made sales of $500,000, of which approximately $50,000 could be considered profit. In Cleveland, Ohio, everyone knew John, an 18-year-old kid who excelled in business, and everyone acknowledged his abilities. One year after these events, in 1859, the first oil well in America was discovered near John D. Rockefeller's office. Oil was found, but it didn't have much value at the time because there were no machines, and this oil was not very useful. The best use they had for oil at that time was to convert it into kerosene and use it in lamps for lighting. John became interested in the oil well that was discovered near his office and wanted to know what could be done with this oil. He gathered and read all the news and writings about oil, and John concluded that oil itself didn't have much value. The valuable thing was the products that could be obtained from it. At that time, the valuable product was white oil. After that, well, many oil wells were discovered in America, and all of their owners were ordinary people. Rockefeller looked at the owners of these wells and saw that they were not doing well. He thought of buying oil from them for a low price and turning it into white oil. The largest oil discovery in America at that time was in Pennsylvania. In 1863, a railway line was built between the oil wells of Pennsylvania and Cleveland, Ohio, which made it possible to bring abundant oil to Ohio. John D. Rockefeller, who was very business savvy, said, Now is the time to build a refinery in Cleveland, considering this railway line and the abundance of oil. He had earned enough money in the past six years to build an acceptable refinery. He understood that playing with oil was like alchemy, and he could build everything from nothing. For this reason, he hired the best chemists in the region and told them to produce the highest quality white oil. He started with $8,000. Approximately two years later, in 1865, they valued the refinery and its equipment at around $72,500, which, if calculated at today's rate, would be more than $1,180,000. But this was just the beginning. Rockefeller knew he was starting his empire because no one had thought of these ideas before. Until that time, 26 refineries had been built in Ohio, 
but all of them produced low-quality white oil, while Rockefeller's white oil had such quality that customers only wanted his product. The sale of those refineries was in trouble. Rockefeller, who was highly intelligent, realized that he could buy these refineries for free. John's method of buying was very interesting. He invited the owners of the refineries one by one, showed them the accounting and income of his refinery, and said, look at how much profit we have made while you have made no profit. If you sell your refinery to us, we will flourish your refinery and we will also hire you as one of the managers. And we will give you a good salary that is higher than the income of your refinery. The owners of refineries one by one came to Rockefeller and said, we are willing. 10 years passed and we reached the year 1880 when 90% of America's refinery production was in Rockefeller's hands. Here, a monopoly had emerged, the largest monopoly in world history at that time. This monopoly had made him so wealthy that he was buying up most of the railroads in America. He would tell the railroad company, I will pay more than anyone else for transportation and you will only carry my goods. With this action, he raised the transportation rates with the railroad and other factories started complaining, saying, how do we transport our products then? The factories protested so much that the US government got involved. When the US government got involved, they saw that there was a monopoly. They saw that in this way, the owner of a monopoly could do whatever he pleased, and the US Congress worked to pass laws against monopolies. But John was ahead of the US government. When he realized that the US government wanted to pass anti-monopoly laws, he opened a trust in New Jersey. Trust means that the Standard Oil Company transformed itself into 40 different companies, ultimately benefiting Rockefeller himself. But this was not considered a monopoly according to the anti-monopoly law, because there were 40 different companies that were competing with each other. In 1890, John D. Rockefeller owned 20,000 oil wells and laid 6,500 kilometers of oil pipelines in America, with over 100,000 Americans working for the Standard Oil Company under Rockefeller's ownership. Rockefeller established his empire at the right time because no other oil wells had been discovered in the world yet. But as we entered the 20th century, oil became more valuable, ships and automobiles were advancing, and in various parts of the world, people were searching for oil. In other parts of the world, in Russia and Asia, they had already found oil. But the first major oil well in the world was discovered on May 26, 1908, in Iran. It was discovered by William Knox Darcy, an Englishman who had obtained the oil extraction rights from the Qajar government. Now let's go back to Rockefeller in 1890, when oil became more and more precious every day and different wells were being discovered all over the world. Rockefeller's income was declining, but Standard Oil, Rockefeller's company, was not a company that could easily be harmed. In 1890, Standard Oil was worth $1 trillion in today's currency. Rockefeller had gained so much power in America that he wasn't worried about oil being discovered elsewhere or having competitors. He had so much money that he was lending it to the US government he continued to grow his wealth until the end of his life. When John D. Rockefeller passed away in 1937, his fortune was estimated to be over $400 billion, earning him the title of the richest businessman in the world at that time. Currently, according to the statistics from Forbes magazine, Elon Musk is the richest person in the world with an estimated wealth of over $219 billion. On July 30, 1863, a boy was born in the city of Springwells, Michigan. His name was Henry. Henry's father was a farmer during a time when farming was one of the most laborious occupations. Without the modern tools we have today, they had to work hard from morning till night in the fields, hoping to harvest a crop if it wasn't affected by pests. As Henry grew up, he witnessed the hardships his father endured and his heart ached for him. As a result, he developed a strong aversion to farming. Despite his father being a farmer and Henry himself having to engage in farming, he knew that there was a better opportunity waiting for him near B, and it was improving day by day. You should know that the city of Detroit, located 12 kilometers from Henry's village, was the most important industrial city in America. 
it was the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution in America. Being close to this city exposed Henry to industries and technology. At the age of 12, Henry became so interested in technology that he wanted to be involved in technical work. For example, when a neighbor's clock broke, he said, I can fix it, even though he had no idea how it worked. He just had the desire to open it up and see how it was made. When Henry turned 14, he saw a steam-powered engine for the first time. His entire focus shifted to it, and he thought, I need to understand how this works. He tried to get a job at the railroad to learn how steam engines worked on locomotives. He approached the railroad administration many times, but they told him he was not of legal age and couldn't be given a job. They said, come back when you're 16. However, when Henry turned 16, instead of going for a job at the railroad, he went to work for a mechanic who repaired these engines. In 1880, when Henry was 17 years old, he encountered something fascinating. An Englishman showed him a gasoline engine, which was built by Nicolaus Otto in Germany. Nicolaus Otto hadn't built this engine for any particular purpose. He just wanted to show that gasoline could be used instead of steam. Though young, when Henry saw this gasoline engine, his mind became completely absorbed in the possibilities it presented. He pondered over its functioning and completely understood its fuel system, but he couldn't figure out its electrical system, how the spark plug ignited the mixture. He said to himself, I need to learn about electricity. He went to the branch of Edison Electric in Detroit and requested a job. They gave him a job because he wanted to delve into electricity. This branch of the Edison company provided electricity to around 1,000 homes in that area. Henry works so well in this company that he goes higher every day. And when he reaches the age of 28, he becomes the CEO of this company. It is in this position that he also builds his first gasoline engine in the workshop of this company. When his engine is ready, he tells himself that he should improve it and put it on a carriage so that it becomes a car. The first car made by Henry Ford in 1896, when he is 33 years old, is ready. He named the car Quadricycle. Henry also made a two-speed gearbox for his car. However, his engine did not have a radiator, so it would get hot after a few minutes of running. Finally, Henry adds a radiator to his car. Meanwhile, a customer appears and offers $200 for his car. Henry says, even better, I'll take the money and build a better one. He receives $200, which is equivalent to $6,000 today, and delivers the car to the customer. Henry builds another quadricycle, but not for sale. He wanted to conduct various experiments and identify the flaws in the quadricycle. Eventually, in 1899, he opens a company and names it Ford Motor Company, a name that still exists. You know that Edison was a major investor and capitalists would come to invest in his company. Ford was previously the CEO of Edison's company. That's why all the investors knew him until they found out that he had started this new company. They said, Hui, we will go to his company and invest because we know the person behind it. And he starts producing quadricycles in his factory, but things don't go well. For two years, everyone works, but they can only produce 20 quadricycles. Henry wonders why it takes so long. How can we increase our production? The company was not profitable in this situation. So many investors asked for their money back. The investors took their money one by one, which not only put the factory to sleep, but also caused the factory to go out of business. After that, Henry became poor again. You know that successful people never give up easily. Despite his poverty, Henry was always thinking about how to start a factory that could have high production. Henry thought about what to do with paper and pen, how to produce a successful car. He designed a car that was better than the quadricycle, at least on paper. But as he designed the car, he also thought about the concept of an assembly line. These designs and thoughts by Henry Ford led to one of the most important inventions of the 20th century, the assembly line, which did not exist until that day. When we reach 1905, Henry gathers himself and launches another factory, a factory where the assembly line is created. Just one year later, in 1906, 300 people work on this assembly line and 25 Ford Model T cars are produced every day. If it weren't for the invention of the assembly line, it would not have been possible. The assembly line was working. However, Henry was not satisfied. He said it should be better and faster. 
In the same year, 1906, Henry does another important thing. He opens another company called Ford Engine Company, which specializes in producing engines and gearboxes. He no longer had to get engines or gearboxes from someone else. This move by Henry Ford increased the speed of the assembly line and made the cars cheaper because the longest time they wasted was waiting for parts from the assembly line. Ford said, I want to produce a car that ordinary people can buy because until then, cars were for the wealthy and kings. In 1908, the first Ford Model T emerged in the following manner, a hassle-free and affordable car. Because it was intended to be cheap, it was only produced in black. Ford succeeded in creating a car that everyone could afford. The Model T introduced in 1908 had a price of $850. When the Model T was unveiled and people saw its picture in the newspapers, they attacked the company. Within a week, they placed 25,000 orders. The demand was so high that they couldn't deliver all of them in the first year, but they managed to deliver around 17,000. When Henry Ford realized the success of his idea, he set up another, much larger factory with a bigger production line. Henry Ford's vision was to make this production line faster and more efficient. As a result, production increased steadily each year. By the time we reached 1910, they were delivering over 20,000 Model T cars. However, only six years later, in 1916, Ford was producing 500,000 Model T cars per year. Henry Ford wanted not only to make a profit, but also for people to benefit from his cars. That's why he increased production, which in turn lowered the prices of the cars. Despite producing the cheapest car in the world, you should remember that in 1908, the Ford Model T cost $850. But eight years later, in 1916, it was even lower at $360, which was less than half the initial price. Ford used to say that every American should have one car. Henry Ford had built such a revolutionary and advanced company that for over 20 years, it had no competitors in the world. In those years, over 60% of the cars in America were Ford Model Ts. Until finally, other companies were able to start competing with Ford in the late 1920s. Companies like Dodge Brothers, Chrysler, and General Motors. You should know that at that time, Dodge Brothers and Chrysler were not together. During this period, Henry Ford was one of the richest people in the world. Although not richer than John D. Rockefeller or Andrew Carnegie. Moreover, it should be noted that Adolf Hitler took inspiration from Henry Ford for the Volkswagen. Hitler liked Ford so much that he always had a picture of him in his office, saying that he was a hero because he had launched a revolution for himself. Henry Ford remained the head of the company until the age of 81, and the company is no longer the same as before. The company had become so influential that during World War II, Boeing's bombers were built in the Ford company. The reason was that they needed a large number of bombers, and Boeing's facilities were insufficient. Therefore, a they turned to the largest company in America, Ford, to start building bombers. In 1945, when Henry Ford was 81 years old and suffering from heart problems, he stepped down as the head of the company and handed it over to his grandson, Henry Ford II, because his son had passed away two years before that date due to stomach cancer. However, he did not like retirement. So two years later in 1947, he passed away due to a heart attack. Today, Ford Motor Company is one of the largest automotive companies in the world. The company is publicly traded, but the Ford family still holds significant power in the company. They control 40% of the company themselves. This company produces cars on five continents, and some of its products are the best selling in the world, such as their Ford F-150 truck. On May 27, 1794, a boy was born in Staten Island, New York, named Cornelius Vanderbilt. His parents, Cornelius Sr., and his mother, who were Dutch immigrants, were extremely poor, both working as laborers. After a few years, Cornelius's mother secured a job in agriculture, which slightly improved their income. His father found employment in a steamboat company and became an operator of one of the passenger boats in New York. Although the family's situation had a slight improvement, they were still struggling. 
At the age of 11, Cornelius dropped out of school and joined the same company where his father worked, the steamboat industry, to contribute to the household expenses. While working in the steamboat industry, Cornelius had different aspirations. He believed that he needed to do something on his own to improve his financial situation, as the wages in the industry were not sufficient for a comfortable life. His mother had saved some money, and Cornelius went to her and asked for a loan of $100. He assured her that he would repay it soon. Initially, his mother hesitated, as they needed the money for their living expenses, but Cornelius persisted. Eventually, his mother agreed and gave him the $100. At that time, $100 was a significant amount for himself, enough to buy a small boat. Cornelius thought to himself, why should I work for a steamboat company when I can own a boat and work for myself? Despite having only completed fifth grade and lacking extensive education, he had a natural business sense. Cornelius quickly realized that if he wanted to succeed in the industry, he had to offer competitive prices to attract customers. He lowered the prices significantly, and customers started flocking to him one after another. When he bought his first boat at the age of 16, he swiftly repaid his mother the $100. From then on, he saved every penny he earned to buy more boats, one after another, expanding his fleet. The number of boats increased progressively. It may be hard to believe, but by the time Cornelius was not yet 18, he owned more than 10 small and large boats, employing 10 people to work for him. When he turned 18, an event occurred that would shape his future. The War of 1812 between America and Britain began, which was part of America's struggle for independence against the British. This war presented an opportunity for Cornelius. The U.S. government entered into a contract with him to transport military supplies across the water to the American side. This work really boosted Cornelius as he had a lot of boats and they were in high demand, providing good rental income. Therefore, he had enough money to invest in sailing. A year later, at the age of 19, Vanderbilt married his cousin's daughter, a woman named Sophia Johnson, who gave birth to 13 children for Vanderbilt. However, Cornelius did not care about these 13 children and his wife. He never even spent time with them, as he was solely focused on making money. He had become somewhat distant from his children. When we reach the 1820s, Cornelius has a lot of money, but he is not satisfied and wants to go higher. This is also the time when steamboats enter the market. Vanderbilt, upon learning about steamboats, only thinks about buying them because they are faster, less troublesome, and bring in more money. You may ask, what about the previous boats? Well, they were sailboats, and the steamboats were a new arrival. During this period, Cornelius begins to gain fame, but with an inappropriate name as a ruthless trader. What was he doing? He charged high prices. Not only did Vanderbilt bring down the prices so much that other merchants were going bankrupt, but he also said, I have to crush them. I need to be the only one standing, and I will buy their boats for a bargain. This way, the number of his boats increased, the reason Vanderbilt was able to lower the prices was that he had prepared himself beforehand and planned to bring down the prices for a year. Even if he incurred losses, he wouldn't go bankrupt. His strategy worked perfectly. He bankrupted all the shipping companies except his own. Cornelius enjoyed this situation. He thought of himself as playing chess and capturing the pieces one by one. His only goal was to win the game entirely. Despite being wealthier than many of New York's rich people at the age of 30, they did not acknowledge him. They said, you are uneducated, your accent is not even New York, and you are uncouth. They would tell him, you have new money, but we have old and antique money. To this, he would reply, I serve all of you very well. Vanderbilt did not pay attention to these remarks. He would go to his chessboard, sit down, move the pieces, and go higher and higher. We arrive in 1849 and Cornelius Vanderbilt is about 55 years old, a fully accomplished wealthy man, but he is still not satisfied. He says, I have to build my life. Another opportunity arises for him. Successful people are always opportunistic, not necessarily in a negative sense, but they recognize opportunities early on. They are not indifferent to them. In 1849, Cornelius Vanderbilt becomes acquainted with the gold rush in California. Perhaps you have heard of the gold rush in California. People realized that there was gold in California, and a large portion of the Eastern American population set out for it. They went to California solely to find gold. They arrived and bought a pickaxe and shovel, going to places where they expected to find gold. 
Interestingly, none of those who went in search of gold profited as much as the sellers of pickaxes and shovels, except for one person, Cornelius Vanderbilt. Why? Because he was also looking for gold, but not the kind of gold ordinary people were seeking. He saw the market's potential and established an institution that transported people from the east coast of America to the west coast, specifically California. And don't think it was by land, because the railroad was not yet fully completed at that time, and people found it easier to board Cornelius's boats and travel to California on foot. Maybe you wonder how the Panama Canal, which hadn't been built yet, transported passengers to Nicaragua. They would take another means of transportation to reach the narrow strip of Nicaragua and then make their way to the Pacific Ocean, where they would board a series of Cornelius boats. These boats would carry them to California. Cornelius set sail for gold. It was the largest transportation project in American history. When nearly half a million people within a very short period wanted to go to the other side of the country, they would say, take the Cornelius boat. Cornelius would say, I'm not going after gold, I'm bringing the people. They will find it themselves. In 1853, Cornelius was 59 years old. An extremely rare event occurred when Cornelius decided to go on vacation. A man who had worked tirelessly since the age of 11, even working on weekends. When he said he wanted to go on a family vacation, they were surprised and asked, what does he have in mind? Surely another business venture. But no, he truly wanted to relax. So he purchased one of the best ships of that time and went to Europe with his family. He entrusted his companies to his employees whom he trusted. However, once they saw his absence, they began embezzling. While in Europe, Cornelius discovered what his employees were doing. He didn't get angry at all. He simply took a piece of paper, wrote a few lines with his limited education, and sent it to his employees. He wrote on the paper, You have committed to deceiving me. I won't file a complaint against you because it would take too long due to the law. But I will ruin you. He signed it and sent it. To reduce his taxes, Vanderbilt had moved his headquarters to Nicaragua. Those who embezzled in his company were all in Nicaragua, despite being Americans. He destabilized Nicaragua to seek revenge against his employees. With his influence over the surrounding countries, Vanderbilt told them not to recognize the government of Nicaragua because it was not a legitimate government. He even provided evidence that confirmed this, which led Nicaragua to gradually descend into instability and even internal conflict. All the employees who had stolen Vanderbilt's money were trapped in the midst of the Civil War. So, the letter that Vanderbilt had written to them with just four words became a reality. Many people, when they turn 60, start thinking about retirement. But Vanderbilt was the opposite. He wanted to expand his capital. When Cornelius turned 60, it seemed like his mind became a bit more active. He focused on a newly emerging mode of transportation, the railroad, and interestingly, he realized the revolutionary impact this means of transportation would have. He put all his boats up for sale when they were at their peak value. He would sell the boats at high prices and invest the money in railways. He always wanted to have exclusive ownership of everything and wanted to enter every sector. He wanted to have full control. Vanderbilt launched a railway company and started operating on the railroad tracks. At that time, there were small private companies that had, for example, two trains and operated on the railroad tracks. Cornelius caused the same disaster for these trains as he did for the steamboat captains. He lowered the prices so much that they went bankrupt and he bought their trains for next to nothing. Vanderbilt's railroad empire was on the rise, even though he started his railroad business after the age of 60. However, he made most of his money through the railroad. Cornelius Vanderbilt lived until the age of 82, until 1877. When he passed away, the New York newspapers reported that he had a fortune of a hundred million. You might say that it's not much considering that billionaires exist today, but $100 million at that time was equivalent to over $200 billion today. Of course, you cannot say he had as much money as Elon Musk. $100 million at that time was one-ninth of all the money in America. So you can't even compare it to $200 billion. Interestingly, when Vanderbilt died, he had more money than the U.S. Treasury. Vanderbilt had divided his wealth before his death. He had 13 children. 
but the one he loved the most was William Henry Vanderbilt. That's why he bequeathed 90% of his wealth to William and 10% to the other 12 children. He even wrote in his will that the other 12 children do not deserve this money and he will not help them. He will only bring their destruction. Despite being known as a ruthless businessman, Vanderbilt is recognized as one of the men who built America. On November 25, 1835, a boy named Andrew was born in Dunfermline, Scotland. Andrew Carnegie is known as one of the builders of America, along with men like Henry Ford or Cornelius Vanderbilt. The Carnegie family was extremely poor. His father worked in a textile factory and barely earned enough to survive. He made life very difficult for him. The Industrial Revolution began, and instead of prospering, it became even more difficult for Andrew's father to earn an income. Things got to the point where, in 1848, Andrew's father sold his entire life. He bought travel tickets to America for his entire family, and with only 20 pounds in his pocket, they boarded a ship and went to America. When they arrived in America, Andrew's father realized that if they went to the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, they could find work and provide shelter for themselves. However, Pittsburgh had its own problems. He couldn't make enough money to live comfortably. Andrew continued to see his father struggling, so he decided to drop out of school and said, I want to work too. He was hired by a telegraph company to deliver telegraphs on his bicycle. Andrew was so intelligent that at the age of 17, he could read and memorize telegraph codes. When a Pittsburgh businessman named Thomas Scott saw how well this boy was doing his job, he said to him, come work for me and I'll pay you a good salary. He offered him $35 a month whereas at the telegraph office, he was only earning 20. Now we come to the year 1961, the year the civil war broke out in America. Andrew, he was making progress in his work when the US government said he had to serve. Andrew Carnegie, who was making progress in his work and didn't want to leave it, managed to arrange $850 for someone else to go in his place. That amount was equivalent to $28,000 today, a considerable sum at the time. During that time, there were only wooden bridges in America's valleys, and the enemy would immediately set them on fire so that the army forces couldn't advance. Andrew heard this news and sat down to think about what could be done. He realized that if he transformed those wooden bridge structures into his own, the problem of fire would be solved. He immediately got to work and established a company called Keystone Bridge Company. He regularly procured Iran and converted the bridges into iron ones. The business was going so well that he ended up buying an iron smelting factory. He produced the iron needed for the bridges himself. Carnegie's iron smelting expanded rapidly, reaching a point where he not only produced iron for bridges, but also for other purposes such as railways and construction. A few years before this date, in 1856, a person named Henry Bessemer invented a method for steel production. Steel had been invented before, but its production was difficult and complex, making it very expensive. However, Bessemer's invention made this process much easier. In 1865, when the American Civil War ended, Carnegie decided to move his company's headquarters to New York because he believed he could grow further there. Despite the fact that New York improved his business, he always wrote in his memoirs that the people of New York were charlatans and couldn't be trusted. Carnegie used Henry Bessemer's invention in his iron smelting and started producing steel, which transformed New York into what it is today. These were the first skyscrapers in the world and were made possible by the steel produced by Carnegie's company. You should know that Henry Bessemer had made this invention years ago, but the first person to give importance to this invention and say it was feasible was Andrew Carnegie. Before him, people said this invention was impossible. Carnegie. He established the world's first steel factory. Andrew's initiative was to hire the best engineers and architects to ensure the highest production in the shortest possible time. He also utilized this initiative in the automotive industry, just like Henry Ford did. However, at that time, Henry Ford had not yet come into the world. Andrew Carnegie was ruthless in his work, saying that they didn't have time to eat the workers. They're afraid they worked more than 10 hours a day 364 days a year in the factory. Not everyone could be fired. However, they had one day off per year, which was the 4th of July, the day of American independence. 
even Christmas and New Year's Day were not holidays. He even wrote in his memoirs that he wished workers were like machines because machines don't need to sleep for eight hours a day. Carnegie became extremely wealthy. The newspapers also praised him, saying that he cared for his workers and helped the poor, among other things. Despite dropping out of school, Andrew Carnegie had extensive knowledge and knew everything about steel. His steel customers didn't have much education, so Carnegie used new vocabulary. For example, he would say that his steels had a special quality and used a specialized name that the customers couldn't understand. In a way, he was selling his steels with a certain exclusivity, and it worked. Not only were the buildings and bridges made with Carnegie's steel rising high, but he also became the biggest customer. Andrew Carnegie produced railways and most of the railroad tracks. If you remember Cornelius Vanderbilt, known as the most ruthless businessman in history, you know that he brought prices down and paralyzed his competitors, buying their companies at a lower price. Carnegie had the same approach, but his competitors were steel makers. He produced such high quality steel and brought the prices down that other companies couldn't compete. And one by one, they sold their factories to Carnegie. Although he grew bigger every day, he didn't care about his employees. And this lack of consideration towards the workers eventually led to strikes. But it is now 1892 and Carnegie is a billionaire. He is one of the richest men in the world so he doesn't pay attention to the strikes. He doesn't value his employees at all. He didn't even prioritize safety measures in the factories, resulting in 9% of the factory workers being killed on the job every year. This was a terrifying figure even for that time. And this happened while Andrew Carnegie would give interviews with newspapers, saying that the workers in his factories should be better taken care of. But he never took any action himself. That's why they called him a hypocrite, but Nonetheless, the workers in his factories had no choice but to continue working. It wasn't like if they didn't work for Carnegie, they would find another job tomorrow. Jobs were not readily available, and Carnegie's work was so monopolistic that it didn't allow others to grow and for these workers to go elsewhere. Time passes, and Andrew Carnegie reaches the age of 70. He had worked hard for 60 years and built a colossal empire. Suddenly, his decision changes. He says, I want to be with my family now, and if someone wants to buy my factories, I am the seller. Here is where this man suddenly turns green. J.P. Morgan, another figure known as the Builders of America, sends a letter to Andrew Carnegie and asks, how much do you want for all the factories? Carnegie replies in a letter to a person named Charles Schwab saying, take this and give it to J.P. Morgan. When J.P. Morgan opens the letter, he sees it written, I want $480 million for my factories. J.P. Morgan doesn't hesitate at all and immediately tells Charles Schwab, I want it. Carnegie receives $480 million and hands over the factories. It goes to J.P. Morgan, and J.P. Morgan changes the name of Carnegie's factory and establishes U.S. Steel, the world's first steel factory, which is still operating. Carnegie was extremely ruthless towards his employees, but nonetheless, he is remembered for his philanthropy and is said to be an important figure who contributed to America's further growth. He didn't know that if he wanted his empire to continue, he had to keep his employees satisfied, which is why he was forced to sell and leave. In 1837, in the state of Connecticut, America, a boy is born named John Pienpont Mangan, or J.P. Morgan for short. J.P. Morgan is the last of the American builders, unlike other American builders who were all born into poor families. J.P. Morgan is born into an extremely wealthy family. His father, Junius Spencer Morgan, was a successful banker in London and was also very rich, but he didn't give J.P. a cent. There is a story that says he puts $1 million in cash in front of J.P., and J.P. thinks he wants to give it to him, but his father tells him, J.P., this is $1 million, learn how to earn it. Later, he takes the one million and goes. They put him in the best school and provide him with the best resources, but they don't give him money, not even a dollar in his pocket. They say, if you want money, you have to work. If you work for me, I'll give you money. For example, sweep my office and I'll give you a dollar. JP Morgan goes through a tough childhood because most of the time he is also sick. His lungs constantly get infected and he always coughs. 
It's the 19th century, and there are no doctors, and they can't find and treat JP's lung infection. He lives with this lung infection for years until he miraculously gets better when he turns 19. Despite being sick, he gets enrolled in the best schools in the world and attends them. Eventually, after years, JP's health improves and he goes to find a job. When they realize that this boy is Mr. Morgan, a famous banker, they immediately hire him on Wall Street. But when it reaches his father's ears, he gets tougher on JP and says, you used my name and got a job. If you want to take away my honor and my name, I disown you. Be careful. In 1859, when JP Morgan is only 22 years old, he takes a big risk with the company's money and buys a Brazilian coffee ship and sells it the same day to another company with a good profit. Although he had made a good profit, he was scolded. Both the company he worked for and his father told him that he had wasted a worthless risk and that all his capital could easily be wiped out. J.P. Morgan says, if they think that way, then I won't work anymore, and he leaves. If you asked him why, he would say they are cowards and cannot be successful businessmen. Although his father was very successful and the company he worked for, young J.P. Morgan had great self-confidence and started his own business. A few months later, he meets a girl named Amelia Sturgis and marries her, but his wife dies four months later from tuberculosis. J.P. Morgan is deeply saddened and to forget, he becomes completely engrossed in his work. During this period, the American Civil War breaks out, and as J.P. is only 24 years old, they say he must serve. It was common at that time for those who had money to pay someone else to go to the military in their place. J.P. finds a cheap substitute who agrees to go to war instead of him for $300. If you remember, Andrew Carnegie also sent someone in his place, but he paid $850. You should know that J.P. Morgan, like Andrew Carnegie or Cornelius Vanderbilt, became wealthy at that time too, because of the American Civil War. For example, one thing J.P. Morgan did that made him rich was buying old and obsolete army weapons for $350 each, and then giving them to a company for refurbishment. Then he would sell them to the government for $22, making a good profit in the process. He made a profit of 600%, but he realized that if he produced these weapons himself, the government would need ready-to-use weapons, and he could easily sell them. In 1871, J.P. Morgan is now very wealthy, but his father is still not satisfied and says, you still have a long way to go before you gain my experience. This remark made him strive harder to surpass his father. That's why he approached a successful American banker named Anthony Drexel and said, let's establish a large private bank together. They built a bank called Drexel Morgan & Co, which still exists today, although its name is Chase, and it is still called Jet Morgan Chase. From this year, 1871, the J.P. Morgan Empire begins to rise, and from then on, he is constantly moving up. During this time, most industries in America are monopolies. For example, oil is in the hands of Rockefeller, steel is controlled by Carnegie, and railroads and shipping belong to Vanderbilt. But Vanderbilt only accepts investors. The others say, no, we have our own money. J.P. Morgan. He pours a lot of capital into the Vanderbilt Railroad Company. During this period, Vanderbilt has aged and become much larger than J.P. Morgan. At that time, all the affairs were in the hands of Vanderbilt's son, William. However, William did not possess his father's talent, and two years after his father's death in 1879, his shortcomings led J.P. Morgan to make the largest investment in the American Railroad, taking control of the entire American West in his own hands. If Cornelius Vanderbilt were alive, he would not have allowed J.P. Morgan to do this. He would have done it himself. William made a move that would diminish Cornelius Vanderbilt's monopoly and give one-third of the power of the American Railroad to J.P. Morgan. At this time, J.P. Morgan is 42 years old and recognized as a prominent American entrepreneur. However, his father always said, No, you are not capable of doing such a thing. Maybe he was proud of his son deep down, but he never showed it. He would talk to his son like this. Look at this picture of J.P. Morgan. It has been edited because he always said, I have an ugly face and my jaw is very large. Retouch my jaw in the photo and then publish it in the newspapers. J.P. Morgan. At that time, he was considered one of the tall figures. 
You should know that in the 19th century, people were shorter, with an average height of 1.65 centimeter, while J.P. Morgan's height was 188 centimeters. At a time when there were no telephones, telegraphs, or Skype, wealthy individuals would always talk face to face, and when two people discussed an important matter, their appearances had a significant impact. J.P. Morgan, with his 188 centimeter height, had a captivating and terrifying appearance, a face with determination. Therefore, in negotiations with others, this appearance and height made people more willing to accept his proposals and ideas. This can be seen in politicians as well, especially in the past. For example, Otto von Bismarck. His height and his imposing figure were very influential in his power, especially in the power of his words. Reza Shah Pahlavi too. Anyone who spoke to him could not oppose him. It should be noted that Reza Shah was also very tall, 193 centimeters at that time. Bismarck was the same height as Reza Shah Pahlavi, 193 centimeters. In summary, we want to say that in the past, physique, height, and appearance had a significant impact on a person's persuasive power. During this time, when J.P. Morgan learned that a person named Thomas Edison was doing something interesting, he conducted some research and quickly went to invest and develop his work. When J.P. Morgan started his collaboration with Edison, the Edison Electric Company was nothing. But after this collaboration started, it grew day by day. And it was with J.P. Morgan's capital that Edison succeeded in electrifying the first city in America, namely Manhattan, New York. Of course, Tesla played an important role in this progress as well, but they didn't give him anything. Since J.P. Morgan was the main investor in the Edison company, he told Edison to change the company's name. Instead of Edison Electric, let's call it General Electric, a colossal company that still exists. We mentioned earlier that Andrew Carnegie at the age of 70 said he wanted to be with his family. If anyone buys my steel factories, I will sell them immediately. Who bought them instantly? J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan gave $480 million to Carnegie and said, go be with your family. Interestingly, years later, J.P. Morgan said that if Carnegie had asked for $580 million, he would have bought it. J.P. Morgan changed the name of Carnegie Steel to U.S. Steel, which still exists today. It is not only the world's first steel company, but also the first billion dollar company in the world. We come to the year 1893, when a major recession occurs in America. People give away all their dollars and buy gold, causing not only the devaluation of the U.S. dollar, but also the collapse of stocks and the economy of the United States and the world. Here is where a great opportunity arises, and an opportunist wants to seize it. J.P. Morgan was that opportunist. He realized that he could offer to the U.S. government and prevent the bankruptcy of the U.S. economy. He buys $650 million in gold bond loans from the U.S. government, which, as you know, was a staggering amount in 1893. This move by J.P. Morgan saved the U.S. economy, but also multiplied his own power and capital several times over. Many opposed this and said it was not right for a banker to save the government and that a capitalist should not have such influence. J.P. Morgan gained significant power and people strongly opposed him saying, what does it mean for a capitalist to have so much influence? It's like being the ruler of the country. But J.P. Morgan was not alone. He also had Rockefeller on his side. This was the time when the power of capitalists surpassed that of the government for the first time. J.P. Morgan was the last person to be recognized as one of America's builders, completing the video of America's builders.